All right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar, um, Kubernetes Backup and Migration Strategies Using Project Frilero. Um, I'm Sabri Blackman. I'm a CNCF ambassador and security engineer at Docker, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenters today, Steve Chris and Tom Spoonmore from Project Frilero. A uh, few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, during the webinar, you will not be able to talk as an attendee. Everyone is muted. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to drop any questions in there, and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Steve and Tom to kick off today's presentation. Great. Thank you, Sri. Uh, my name is Tom Spoonmore. I'm a product manager at VMware. I'm a Valero product uh, SME. And uh, joining me today is Steve Chris. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Chris. I'm a software engineer at VMware. I uh, joined about six months ago as part of the Heptio acquisition, and I'm the tech lead for Valero. And also joining us today on keyboards is uh, Carlicia Campos. Uh, Carlicia is uh, will be answering Q and A uh, during the uh, during the throughout the webinar today. Glad to be here and help out. Okay. Um, So today's agenda is we'll be talking about uh, Kubernetes backup and restore migration use cases, uh, how to think about uh, backup and restore in a cloud native world. Uh, we'll, there'll be an introduction to Valero and the project. Uh, we'll talk about strategies for protecting your applications in a uh, cloud native way. Uh, Steve will also be doing a demo of, uh, of migration and, and Valero uh, backup and restore. So, uh, you know, Kubernetes is a great uh, platform for running your applications. Uh, and uh, as, um, as with all uh, data processing uh, data applications, you know, you're going to need to uh, provide some data protection capabilities uh, for, for those applications. <clears throat> so there's a number of use cases that you need to, to uh, be prepared for, you know, disaster recovery, data protection, <clears throat> data migration uh, and uh, and project Valero is uh, is one way to to help uh, do that so in the di disaster recovery uh, use case uh, there's uh, you'll be considering ways that you can rebuild your clusters uh, if something happens to your cluster or if you choose to rebuild it uh, to uh, take uh, backups of your applications point in time backups restore those backups for a variety of different reasons, uh, or provide recovery in the case of, uh, in the case of, uh, of a failure of some kind. Uh, on the data protection side, uh, you have to be concerned about data losses with any uh, data application. Uh, it's possible you could have data corruption. Um, applications could, uh, could uh, applications or hardware could, could go bad, uh, could create corruption. Um, you could have uh, uh, other reasons why your data becomes corrupted and you have to go back to a certain point in time restoration. And for uh, a number of uh, industries, um, archival retention is, is critical in the legal industry and, and other regulated uh, industries. Just having uh, archives of data is uh, a regulatory and compliance issue that, that has to be planned for. And in the world of uh, public cloud and private cloud, we see a data migration use case uh, from our uh, customers as well. Um, and for data migration, you're, these are times where you want to move from uh, one cloud platform to another perhaps. Uh, sometimes just the, um, the complexity of, of Kubernetes upgrades uh, causes you to uh, choose to rebuild a cluster rather than doing an upgrade to a cluster. And in those cases, you'll want to move your uh, data from and your applications from one cluster to another. The other use case that we're seeing uh, quite often with, with users is the, um, uh, the need to hydrate uh, or bring data into one of their uh, test or, or staging environments from a production or other environment uh, for uh, 
for testing purposes, for development purposes, and other uh, other reasons that uh, that they want to have uh, data available uh, across a number of environments. And so these are all reasons that uh, that you would want to use uh, backup and restore technologies uh, to be able to um, you know provide responses for each one of these use cases. So uh, Project Valero, just a little bit of background on Valero. Valero is an open source tool for backing up your uh, uh, Kubernetes clusters and persistent volumes for your applications. Uh, it works both uh, on-premise and in public clouds uh, and natively on Kubernetes. Um, so Valero, uh, unlike many backup and restore utilities, isn't just concerned with passing a file system and picking up the files but it also uh, is uh, aware that uh, Kubernetes itself is a really a running state uh, machine uh, that is uh, managing the, the state of all of your applications, the deployments of the, the deployment manifest for all those applications. And all that is considered data uh, to Valero that needs to be, uh, that needs to be backed up. Uh, currently we're um, well over uh, uh, 2,500 uh, uh, stars on, on GitHub. Uh, we are at version 1.0, and, uh, and as of this week, we're 100 uh, contributors strong in the project, and we're uh, super uh, happy about that. Um, Valero itself has a couple of different components. Uh, one of them is a command line interface that you can use to uh, uh, install uh, Valero, to also initiate backups, to create backup schedules, uh, to uh, uh, you know, add backup locations and targets. Uh, as well as to perform restore operations. So uh, uh, then uh, the, on the uh, server side is a server application, a controller that operates on a number of uh, uh, CRDs that are created by the Valero command line uh, that uh, give instruction to the server as to how it should, um, how it should go about uh, performing backups and restores. So Valero seeks to address each of the, the use cases that we uh, spoke about before. So on the disaster recovery side of things, uh, Valero uh, reduces the time to recover uh, your clusters in the case of some kind of infrastructure loss, data corruption, or other kind of uh, service outage. Um, Valero uh, backs up you know, all of the uh, objects in your cluster and can, uh, in a very, uh, uh, very easy way uh, recover the cluster uh, to a new target cluster. Uh, for data migration, um, Valero does have a lot of capabilities to allow portability of, uh, of the objects on your cluster uh, from one cluster to another. Um, there's also techniques which uh, Steve will go into a little bit later for doing things like, uh, uh, like um, uh, transforming uh, data objects as they move from one cluster to another, uh, perhaps, you know, data objects like, you know, um, uh, uh, storage classes, et cetera, need to change from one, from a, a source to a target cluster. Valero has all of these kinds of capabilities and an understanding of how to make those migrations uh, successful. Uh, the other thing Valero is, uh, you know, like uh, Kubernetes itself and many other uh, cloud native tools is, so it integrates with your DevOps workflow. So uh, you, can, uh, you can use uh, uh, GitOps kind of strategies to, uh, to drive Valero. Uh, you can also create kind of uh, ephemeral clones of, of, the na of namespaces. So if, uh, you need to do an operation on uh, a namespace or you need to transform a, a namespace uh, from one cluster to another or, uh, or otherwise make it available. Uh, to another team or set of users. It's very easy with Valero to uh, use the backup and restore of, of, a, of a namespace. And Valero really understands how to, how to deal with that and how to understand what's in a namespace, all the objects, how to reconstitute those objects uh, and data volumes into another namespace successfully. And so this kind of sets us up for what we really think is kind of a, a future for ephemeral clusters and Valero uh, provides a capability to really rebuild clusters in a uh, in a very easy and scriptable way, so that you know we can start thinking of of clusters in ways that we are thinking of uh, cloud native applications, where 
the application can be uh, completely uh, removed, uh, restored, um, and uh, or components of the application are resilient because of uh, strategies you know, like um, uh, uh, consistency uh, and um, uh, declarative, uh, de uh, declarative YAML. So uh, Valero allows you to start thinking of your entire clusters in this way so that uh, it unlocks the abilities uh, to be able to uh, easily reconstitute clusters. And, and again, as I pointed out uh, before, you, know, you can think uh, in terms of uh, these clusters being um, uh, uh, so easy to reconstitute that you don't really even need to do upgrades. You can just uh, build new clusters and transition your applications from one cluster to another. So, um, so how does how do we think about uh, the new paradigm uh, of backup that Valero is is coming with uh, as it relates to uh, maybe the way that we've traditionally thought about backup and restore. So, um, so traditional backup and restore, you know, you're really backing up an application and the application is really the hardware that it's running on, right? So when you're, so uh, in a pre-cloud native world, you're backing up a, a server, applications ran on a server, server had an OS, configurations, uh, configurations of the application, file system stru structures, et cetera. All of these things needed to be backed up uh, in a very uh, uh, a very kind of infrastructure focused way, but uh, as we move into uh, cloud native applications, we're not so much uh, uh, interested in the underlying infrastructure as that's been largely abstracted away. So we need to think about uh, things a little bit differently, and particularly as it relates to Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes itself, like I said before, is a it's a, a it's a, a deployed application itself. It is a stateful, uh, it is a stateful um, uh, uh, operations platform, right? So there is data associated with that. Uh, so uh, your application can be uh, deployed across a number of nodes. Uh, it can, uh, the state of that application, both the desired state as well as the operation state uh, are stored in a database called etcd. And we are concerned now with uh, not just backing up the application, but you know, how we deal with that, how that application is distributed across uh, nodes, uh, applications that are uh, storing state in etcd, uh, the, uh, the Kubernetes itself uh, storing of, of that, uh, of its own state in etcd, and, uh, and then, then of course the application deployments themselves themselves, uh, the uh, deployment resources themselves and how they're, how they're handled. So, uh, so we need to think about, you know, how all of this stuff is uh, deployed and tied together and all of the various objects that are, you know, underpinning an application, how they uh, are related to one another and how they can be uh, reconstituted in a, uh, in a consistent way. And this is what Valero uh, endeavors to do. So, uh, with that, I'll talk. I'll let uh, Steve talk a little bit about Valero's a technical approach and, and how we actually do that. All right, thanks, Tom. So uh, yeah, so things are definitely a little bit more complicated in a Kubernetes environment than in a kind of a traditional IT environment when it comes to data protection. And so, um, you know, the first step to developing our data protection strategy is really to think about where is the state within uh, a Kubernetes system. Um, and so, you know, the first place that, that most folks think about when they think about state in Kubernetes is that etcd database that Tom alluded to. So this is, uh, you know, the backing store for the Kubernetes API. This is where all of your deployments are defined, your config maps and secrets and pods, et cetera. Um, and so this is, this is a dynamic store of data that's going to be changing as uh, users are deploying applications to your Kubernetes platform. And so this is going to be super important to be able to, uh, to protect and to have backups and to be able to recover. And then additionally, uh, you know, the second main store of state within this environment is your, your persistent volume. So this is really where your applications are storing their data. Uh, and they're doing this in a Kubernetes native way uh, using declarative definitions for these volumes. 
uh, but we really need to be able to uh, back up not just the configuration of these things, but the data inside them as well uh, in a way that's linked back to the, uh, the Kubernetes application definitions. When we think about the, uh, the nodes that make up the cluster though, so your masters and your workers, um, there's not a lot of state uh, that's inherent in these things themselves. Um, so each of these nodes are gonna be running a set of the, uh, the core Kubernetes components. So you know, on the master, we'll have the API server running, we'll have the controller manager running, and the workers will be running the kubelet and kube proxy and other things like that. But these really aren't uh, changing very much over time. They're, they're essentially a set of commodity components that can be used to define a cluster. Uh, and so when we think about the, the approaches to kind of data protection for each of these components, it's gonna vary based on um, whether they are in this kind of stateful category or in the, the stateless category. So next slide, please, Tom. All right, so, um, you know, starting on the left, when we're, we're talking about the nodes that make up a Kubernetes cluster, um, you know, it's our view that uh, it's less important to think about backup and restore here uh, than it is to think about really using automation to make it uh, very trivial, very straightforward to provision new infrastructure as needed to replace, uh, to replace existing ones. Um, and so, you know, whether you're using Ansible, Puppet, Chef, et cetera, um, the, the focus I think here is really on making it super easy to stamp out a new copy of a worker node or a master node uh, so that if you need to replace one in your cluster, you're able to do that. And this applies not just for individual nodes, but for clusters as well. So Tom alluded to the uh, kind of concept of ephemeral clusters a few slides ago. Um, Cluster API is a great example of an effort that's going on in the Kubernetes community to really make it uh, very, very straightforward to stamp out new clusters based on a, a predefined template. And so we think that's kind of the right approach to think about uh, how to deal with needing to replace individual nodes or clusters within a node. And then once you do that, there are, you know, there are tools that Kubernetes provides, that Kube Control provides for uh, safely um, taking unhealthy nodes out of your clusters and uh, swapping in a new healthy node that you've been able to stamp out from your template. On the right side, though, things are a little bit more complicated. So with etcd and persistent volumes, you can't just reproduce these from a template. These are they store dynamic data and they're changing over time. And so we do really need to think about how to be able to uh, back these up and recover to specific points in time. Next slide. All right, so let's let's dive into each of those stateful components a little bit and, and talk about some strategies for uh, for data protection here. So starting with etcd, you know, there are a number of different approaches we can take to uh, protecting this data. And the first two, uh, you know, block and file system backups uh, basically mean that you're you're taking uh, either block or file level backups of the device that uh, that etcd is storing its data on. And this is, you know, kind of a good uh, basic approach. Um, it's kind of the lowest common denominator and it'll get you a, a certain level of data protection uh, for that data. Uh, but etcd itself is a distributed system, typically runs multiple replicas. And so uh, if we really want to get uh, application consistent backups of this data, um, it makes sense to look at, uh, at the etcd CTL's uh, capabilities for doing snapshots of the cluster. And this will, this will give you application consistent backups of the entire data set that's stored within etcd. But there, there is an, another approach to backing up this data. And so we know that within Kubernetes, etcd is used to store uh, the, the data for your API resources. Uh, and so another approach to backing up this data is to use the Kubernetes API itself to actually access the data that's in etcd uh, and store it in a backup. Um, Kubernetes, the Kubernetes API provides something called a discovery API, uh, which enables you to uh, kind of dynamically you discover all of the different resource types that exist within the API. Uh, and then from there, you're able to, to capture the full definitions of each of those. So this is another viable approach for, uh, for accessing that data that's in etcd to back it up. And then on the persistent volume side, we, again, we have a few different approaches. Um, so the first one, uh, you know, is to really rely on your storage provider. Uh, this may be a public cloud provider or maybe a, an on-premises provider, but to rely on snapshots uh, as a way to capture point-in-time uh, references to your data 
uh, and then to be able to uh, potentially create durable backups from those uh, so that you're able to restore if you need to. Uh, and this is typically kind of a, a block level function, uh, but you can also look at taking file system backups of the persistent volumes that you're using. Um, this you know, would be particularly useful if you're looking at doing kind of single file recovery, uh, if that's an important use case for you. Uh, and then the, you know, a third option here that's emerging is, um, is looking at the container storage interface, uh, which is becoming a standard for Kubernetes and other uh, container orchestration systems, and looking at the emerging uh, snapshot APIs that are being added to those. Now, those are uh, currently in an alpha state. Um, the, the upstream storage community is, is looking at moving these to beta uh, relatively quickly. Um, but this, this provides another kind of integration point for uh, being able to take point in time snapshots of uh, the persistent volumes you're using. Next slide. All right, so, uh, so with that background, let's talk a little bit about uh, Valero and its approach to data protection. Um, so first of all, Valero enables you to back up uh, both your Kubernetes objects, uh, so all the, the Kubernetes API data that's stored in etcd, uh, as well as your application's persistent volumes. So Valero covers both of these uh, stateful components that we've been talking about. And as far as the, the Kubernetes objects go, um, Valero uses the, the Kubernetes discovery API to access this data. So it's not talking directly to etcd uh, to back up this information. And there are a few, a few different reasons that we chose this approach. Um, you know, the first one is that uh, on a lot of managed uh, cloud provider Kubernetes platforms, uh, you're not going to have direct access to etcd. Um, so in, in things like Google Kubernetes Engine or Azure's uh, Kubernetes Engine, um, as a user, you're not going to have direct access to etcd. And so there's, there's not actually a way to, to do a direct backup there. So we needed an, an alternate approach. Um, beyond that, though, the, the API gives us a lot of uh, capabilities that we wouldn't have even if we were uh, doing direct etcd backups. So using the API, we can do sort of fine-grained filtering and selection of the resources that we want to back up. Uh, and this also means that when it comes time to restore, we can be much more precise about uh, what, which applications, which particular resources we want to restore. And then Using the API also enables us to, uh, to kind of transform this data as we're doing backups or restores. So, uh, you know, if, if you're in a migration scenario, you may actually need to make some changes to your, uh, your YAML manifest as you're restoring data into a different cluster. Uh, and so using an API driven approach gives us this opportunity to transform these resources uh, while we're restoring them. Uh, and then Valero uh, stores all this data in, uh, in an object storage system, typically in the cloud. And so this makes it, uh, you know, makes the, the lifespan of these backups exist beyond the lifespan of your individual cluster. So that if you, uh, if you lose a cluster or you need to migrate to an additional cluster, you have a, kind of a central location where that backup data exists. And then as far as uh, persistent volume backup and restore, so Valero uses uh, the cloud provider snapshot APIs. Um, Valero has a, uh, an extensible plugin system so that uh, additional providers can be added uh, as supported Valero providers uh, without, without needing to modify the core Valero code. Um, but, but this is really our, our primary approach to backing up persistent volumes. Um, we also have a beta support for a uh, file system level backup solution. Uh, and we use a, an open source tool called Restic. Uh, which is a generic uh, file level backup solution. And so this can be really useful if you're uh, maybe running on a storage provider that doesn't have snapshot APIs. Uh, maybe uh, you just, uh, Valero plugin hasn't developed, been developed yet for your provider. Uh, or this is also really useful if you're doing cross provider migrations because you do get a, uh, a generic provider agnostic format for your backups. And then beyond that, um, you know, Valero has a, a variety of different features that, uh, that help with your backup and restore workflows. So uh, it supports both ad hoc and scheduled backups. Um, as I mentioned before, there's, uh, there's some sophisticated filtering that you can do as you're backing up or restoring resources. So you can select specific namespaces to back up, specific resource types. You can also use label selectors to identify uh, just a subset of resources that you want. And it's also possible to uh, restore uh, resources into different namespaces and then you back them up. And so this can be really useful if you're trying to 
clone an existing environment. Uh, if you're trying to migrate something from uh, maybe a dev environment to a QA environment that uses different namespaces. And then as I, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, Bolero is also uh, very extensible. So we have a plugin mechanism uh, so that new object and block storage providers can be added to uh, Bolero. Uh, and we also support um, two additional types of plugins called backup and restore item actions. And these allow uh, you as a user of Valero to write uh, custom bits of logic that can actually transform resources as they're being backed up or restored. Uh, so this helps you handle any individual use cases that, that you may have that aren't covered by the, uh, the core Valero platform. All right, next slide. So uh, just a kind of a quick overview of what a, what a standard Valero workflow might look like. Um, so in this diagram, we have two different Kubernetes clusters, one on the left, one on the right. Um, and starting on the left in Kubernetes cluster A, uh, a uh, we're using the Valero CLI to take a backup. Um, and if you look at the command text just above the cluster box there, you'll see we're, we're creating a backup. We're including one specific namespace called example. Uh, and we're specifying a flag that, that indicates that we want to snapshot our persistent volumes. And so uh, the Valero controller that's running in that cluster will be communicating with the Kubernetes API there, uh, fetching all the resources that need to be backed up, uh, and then reaching out to the cloud provider's API to take snapshots of any persistent volumes that are being used by those resources and storing them in an object storage bucket uh, in the cloud here in the center. And then on the right in cluster B, we have uh, another instance of Valero. And so in this case, we're doing sort of a migration. Uh, so this cluster is configured to be able to restore backups from the, the same location where cluster A was creating them. Uh, so on the right, we're running a, a Valero CLI command to create a restore. Uh, we're specifying the name of the backup that was created from cluster A. Uh, and the Valero controller that's running in cluster B here will be reading the contents of that backup uh, and applying all of the API resources to the Kubernetes API within cluster B. Uh, and additionally, we'll be uh, taking the persistent volume snapshots, uh, reconstituting volumes from those snapshots, and then attaching them correctly to the, uh, the persistent volumes within cluster B. And so with that, uh, this kind of sets us up for a couple of demos. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. All right. So the, the first thing I'll show here um, is, uh, a backup and restore within an individual cluster. And so what I have here is uh, a cluster running in GKE. Um, you can see from my uh, command prompt here that it's labeled as cluster one. Um, and within this cluster, I'm, I'm running an instance of the WordPress application uh, that's using MySQL uh, as a data store. Um, and so the, the first thing I'm showing here is that we actually have a, a service up to access that WordPress instance. Um, so if I jump over to a browser window, uh, you can see this is my WordPress blog. Uh, it's called Steve, and I have a, a hello CNCF blog post here. So jumping back to the terminal, um, the first thing I want to do is take a backup of this application as it exists now. So I'm going to use the, the Valero command line, and I'm going to say Valero backup create. Uh, I'll just call it WP for WordPress. And specifically, I want to include uh, the WP namespace. So this is where all of my deployments and persistent volume claims are de defined. And I'll also use the dash dash wait flag uh, so that I know when this backup's done. And so Valero now is, is talking to that Kubernetes discovery API, accessing all of the resources within that namespace, uh, and also taking persistent volume snapshots of the volumes that are used. Um, so the backup's complete now. Uh, we see that that ran pretty quickly. And so if I use Valero backup get, I can see here's our, our backup uh, titled WP. Uh, it's completed. And I can also run Valero backup describe WP. Uh, and I can use the dash dash details flag to see some additional information about it. So there's a variety of information that's shown here. Um, 
in this top section, uh, we just see some information on the kind of the spec for the backup that we created. So uh, the main, main thing to see here is that we have a namespaces section that defines which namespaces were included in the backup. Uh, and since I used that flag while I created the backup, we see that the, uh, that was the included namespace. And then scrolling down towards the bottom, uh, you'll see this section here, which describes the persistent volumes that were backed up as part of this Valero backup. And so Valero found that there were two different PVCs that were being used by that WP namespace. Uh, and so for each one, it created a, uh, a snapshot uh, using the, the GCP APIs. And so here we have references to those snapshot IDs uh, and some additional metadata that'll be useful uh, when we need to restore those. So uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is, is sort of simulate a disaster. Um, and so the, you know, the most straightforward way to do this is just to delete, delete the namespace, uh, the WordPress namespace. And uh, you know, this, this really, this is gonna take a minute to delete, but um, really, you know, you can imagine a, a number of different scenarios here, maybe, um, you know, a user accidentally applied a configuration uh, to this namespace that uh, that messed up your your application definition, and you want to be able to roll back to a previous state. Um, maybe you know there was another incident, and your persistent volume data got uh, got corrupted, and you want to restore. Um, and so there, are, you know, a number of different ways that you can think about this use case. But uh, in general, we we look at just deleting the namespace as kind of the primary. Uh, issue that we would need to recover from. All right, so the namespace has been deleted and I'll just take a quick look. Uh, so we no longer have that WP namespace and I'll just pop back to my browser window and do a refresh and you'll see that we're, we're not able to connect uh, at this point in time. The, the service no longer exists, the pods no longer exist. So going back to the terminal, um, what I'd like to do now is actually uh, restore that namespace using Valero. Um, so I'll just take another look at the backups I have. So my one backup is called WP. So I will now say Valero restore create, and I'll say from backup WP, and I'll kick that off. And now while this is running, we can, we can get a little bit of information on what's happening. So if I, if I put a watch on the persistent volumes in this cluster, well, you'll see that they actually were already created. Um, so that, that happened pretty quickly. You can see that they're created within the last few seconds. Um, and so now if I look at uh, the pods within the namespace WP, uh, you'll see that they were both recreated within the last few seconds and they're, they're now in the process of creating. And so if we give this a couple more seconds, uh, the restore should be completed and the pods should be up and running. Um, I can use the Valero restore get command to look at the status of my, uh, my restore and we can see that it's completed. Um, and let me take one more look and see if the pods are up and running. They are, they're up and running. And so now what I need to do is get the IP address for my, uh, my service. Um, this will change since we restored it. And so WordPress now has this external IP address. Uh, you can see it was just recreated under a minute ago. And so if I go back to the browser, pull up this IP, we're, we're now connected back to a WordPress site. And so if I look here, we'll see that uh, that post that, uh, that was there in my, my previous copy of the site is, is back up. So we've been able to successfully restore uh, from, from that incident. All right, so, so that's great for kind of restoring within a single cluster. Um, but I also wanna take a look at another scenario, which is uh, migrating an application um, not just to a different cluster, but also to an entirely different cloud provider. Um, and so to do this, we're gonna use Valero's uh, RESTIC integration, which I, I talked about uh, a couple of minutes ago. So the first thing we need to do um, is we need to tell Valero that we want to use RESTIC to back up the persistent volumes rather than using uh, GCP snapshots. And we need to use RESTIC in this scenario because uh, I'm going to be migrating this application into an Azure cluster and uh, Azure has no way of, of knowing how to restore a GCP snapshot. So RESTIC will give us uh, kind of that, 
provider agnostic backup of our data uh, so that we can restore it into a, another platform. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, actually, I, in order to tell Valero that I want to use Rustic, I need to add some annotations to the, uh, the WordPress and the MySQL pods. Um, and so I have some YAML definitions here. So I'll just uncomment this, this annotation, which uh, tells Valero to use Rustic to back up this persistent volume. So I'll do that for MySQL and also for WordPress. Uh, and then I'm going to go back here and just reapply uh, those manifests. Um, we'll actually get a new set of, of pods that are scheduled. So uh, just put a watch on that so that I know when those are completed. Um, but so what's going to happen from here is that we'll, we'll take another backup. Uh, and this one will we'll actually use Restic to back up those persistent volumes. Um, and then I'll switch over to my Azure cluster and, and show you how to configure it to be able to, uh, to pull the backup from the place where this GKE cluster is currently uh, putting backups. All right, the, the new pods are coming up, so I'll just give it a couple more seconds and, uh, and we should be ready to take a backup. Sometimes this goes a little faster, sometimes it goes a little slower. So apologies for the delay there, but it looks like the pods are up and running now. So uh, I'm just gonna clear my screen. So at this point, I'll take a new backup. So I'm gonna use a similar command to, to last time. So I'll say Valero backup create. Uh, this time I'll call it wp-restic so that we know we're using Restic backups. Uh, and again, I just want the WP namespace, so all the resources in there. And I'll use the dash dash wait flag as well. So Valero is going through a similar process of talking to the Kubernetes discovery API at this point, but instead of using uh, the cloud provider snapshot APIs, we'll actually be executing Rustic to take file level backups of the contents of these persistent volumes. All right, so we have a backup now. Um, I'm going to actually use this command that's, that's given to me here um, to look at some of the details of those. I'll use the details flag. And so the most important thing to notice that's different here is on the bottom, instead of having a list of uh, persistent volume snapshots, uh, we actually have a section called Rustic Backups, which uh, tells us the, the pods and, and the volumes within those pods that were backed up. All right, so we have our backup now. So uh, now we want to switch over to the Azure cluster that we're going to restore into and get it configured uh, to be ready to restore. So you can see here that I'm on cluster two Azure. And if we look at the namespaces, we'll see I don't have a WordPress namespace right now. So the first thing I need to do is create uh, what's called a backup storage location, which tells this cluster uh, where, where these backups are stored. Um, and so to do that, I can say Valero backup location create. Uh, I'm going to call it GCP. Um, need to give it a provider, uh, which is GCP. Uh, I also need to tell it the name of the bucket, which is Steve Valero backups. Uh, and then the final thing, which is a new feature uh, that hasn't been released yet, but will be uh, coming out in 1.1, uh, is an access mode. Um, and so I want to set this location up to be read only from the perspective of the Azure cluster, because I only want to be able to restore these backups. I don't want to be able to create new backups in this bucket uh, or to, uh, to expire or delete any of the backups that are in there. Um, so this can be really useful for, uh, for a migration scenario. So, and then the other thing I need to do is um, if I switch back to cluster one, if I look at the storage classes that I have in this cluster, uh, we can see that there's just one and it's called standard. And then if I go back to my Azure cluster where I want to restore, you can see that I have three storage classes, but none of them are called standard. Um, and so 
when I do a restore, I actually want to change the storage class of the persistent volume so that uh, they're, they're no longer called standard, but instead they're called manage premium. Um, and so we have another new feature, which we'll be shipping in 1.1, which allows you to do this really easily. Um, and so uh, it's implemented as a, a plugin for Valero, but there's uh, a config map uh, which will be fully documented with 1.1, which allows you to uh, specify uh, remappings of storage classes. And so what we want to do here is just in the data section for this config map, add a new mapping from the standard storage class to the managed premium storage class. So I'll save that. So we should be set up now. And so uh, since we added that backup location pointing to the GCP bucket, we should actually be able to see now if I run a Valero backup get uh, those two backups that we just created from the GCP cluster. Um, and so this WP Rustic backup is the one that we're going to want to restore here. So uh, now I'll execute a restore. So I'll say Valero restore create from backup WP Rustic. And I'll start that. And so now uh, this, the Valero running in this Azure cluster will be downloading that backup and, and going through a restore process. So we can take a look at what's going on with the persistent volumes while this restore runs. All right, so we, we see that we just actually got the two persistent volumes uh, created in this cluster. And so if you look here under the storage class, you'll see that those were successfully remapped. Uh, so they now have the managed premium storage class within the Azure cluster. Um, and then take a look at the pods that are running in the WordPress namespace. So these were just created and you can see they're, they're currently running in a NIC container. Uh, so this is part of the Rustic restore process that Valero is executing. Um, now this may, may take, uh, a minute or two um, in the Azure cluster, we're dynamically provisioning empty uh, volumes. Uh, we're then running the Rustic restore process to actually take the contents of those persistent volumes from the GCP cluster uh, and restoring them into these, uh, these new empty PVs. So uh, this may take a minute or two, uh, so just bear with it. Um, just going back to the, the storage class mapping, um, this, this new feature that we added in 1.1 is something that we heard a lot from users, um, particularly for this migration scenario, um, because a lot of times as you're migrating across different providers, uh, the storage class names don't, don't line up. And so you need a way to be able to modify those uh, as they're coming into the new provider. So uh, we're pretty excited to be able to, to support this natively going forward. All right, so let's see. So it looks like one of our pods is up and running at this point. It looks like the MySQL pod is running. Um, and it looks like the WordPress pod is still restoring. So we can also um, use this Valero restore describe command to get a little, get a sense of what's going on uh, with the restore. And so you can see that the MySQL restore has completed and the, the one for the WordPress itself is, is uh, still pending. So it looks like this one's just taking a little bit longer to provision the disk, but it's, it's finally coming up. So, all right, so now that WordPress uh, pod is up and running. And if I just take one more look at the status of the restore, we'll see that it's completed. So that's a good sign. And so now the last thing that I need to do is actually uh, look at the services in the WordPress namespace uh, because I need to get the IP address for this new service that's running in Azure. And so I'll take that and just switch over to a browser window and I'll pull it up and boom, there we go. So we have our WordPress site up and running. Uh, we have our CNCF blog post and this is, this is now being hosted from Azure. So uh, yeah, so that pretty much concludes the demo. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Tom, do you wanna reshare the presentation?
And we should see the uh, presentation again. And yeah, can you just jump to the next slide? There we go. All right, so just quickly, uh, so as I mentioned, we're currently on Valero 1.0. Um, we added a, a handful of stability and usability features uh, in that release. So um, one of the main ones was the Valero install command to make it uh, really easy to get up and running with Valero. Uh, we also um, uh, did some work on the community supported Helm chart. So we're now officially supporting the Helm chart uh, going forward as an installation me uh, mechanism. Uh, and then we also improved our, our plugin integration. So we improved stability and, and the developer experience there. Uh, and our Rustic integration for doing file level backups uh, is, in, is considered beta as of 1.0. Uh, and we're currently working on, on 1.1. Uh, so this should be coming out by the end of the summer. Um, we have a, a handful of different features here. So um, we have been doing some prototyping of uh, an integration between Valero and the CSI snapshot APIs. Um, so the, the CSI snapshot APIs are alpha. Um, and so our, our integration is, is alpha as well, but we're exploring this and looking at how to support it going forward. Um, and then we're also making a number of Rustic uh, stability improvements with an eye towards moving this integration to, uh, to be generally available. Um, and we've also used, uh, added the support for read-only storage locations, which I, which I demoed. Uh, and we're, um, we're adding better support for defining resource, resource usage uh, requests and limits for, uh, for the Valero pods that are running. And so with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Tom to wrap up. Okay, fantastic, Steve. Thank you so much. Uh, the uh, demo was, was really great. Um, and, uh, glad nothing got stuck. <laughs> so that was a live demo folks. Uh, so, um, one thing I wanted to draw your attention to is, you know, we're very, um, uh, involved with the community. We encourage community involvement with, uh, with Valero. And, uh, well, one of the things that we're doing right now is it's launching literally today, uh, is we're doing a data protection survey. So this is a, a data protection survey for, um, for cloud native backup. So, uh, so we're really interested in, in getting your feedback uh, on um, uh, how you're thinking about backup and restore, uh, what providers you're using, et cetera. Uh, you can find all of those, uh, uh, you can find uh, links to that survey at valero.io slash survey. Um, we will be um, uh, sharing this back with the community. So uh, once we get the uh, results and we tally those, we'll share those back and make it available for everyone to, um, to, to data mine and take a look at it. So it'd be a great opportunity for, uh, for us to learn just kind of what's going on in the community and how people are thinking about, uh, about backup. Uh, and you know, clearly uh, from a Valero standpoint, we'll be taking a look at it from the perspective of uh, trying to find out uh, what the best way to prioritize our um, uh, feature development going forward. So please uh, uh, you know, look for the survey and, uh, and in um, a few weeks we will uh, we'll close the survey and tally everything back and, and post that back on, on the Valero IO website. So speaking of the Valero IO website, uh, that is where you can find uh, Valero uh, and any blog posts and, and other uh, valuable links like to our GitHub. Uh, you can find us uh, on GitHub at Heptio Valero. Uh, also, please follow us on Twitter at Project Valero uh, for the latest news. Um, and I'm certain that we'll be tweeting out uh, about the, the survey and also once the survey results are posted. So go ahead and follow Project Valero there. Uh, for all the latest news on what's going on. And, uh, and in terms of getting questions uh, answered as you're using Valero or thinking about using Valero, uh, please join us on the Kubernetes Slack. You can find us at the channel uh, Valero. Um, and uh, all of us are, are on on a daily basis and uh, looking forward to interacting with, with everyone uh, and with the community. So um, the other thing you can do is you can join our mailing list at Project Valero, which is on uh, the on Google Groups, and uh, the Valero. Um, uh, we also have community meetings uh, twice a month. We just had one uh, a couple of days ago. They're the first and third Tuesday of every month, and you can find out more about that on our GitHub at Heptio uh, 
uh, our GitHub Heptio uh, Valero community. So uh, with that, uh, I think we have a little bit of time for, uh, for some Q&A. Um, I know that uh, Carlicia uh, has been answering a bunch of questions on, uh, on the chat, so that's fantastic. Uh, uh, Carlicia, are there uh, questions that, uh, that should be answered verbally at this point? Yeah, I love, love it uh, if you could uh, answer these questions. We get, have some good ones. So we have about eight minutes, and I'd love it if we could blow through all of them. We have about six. I'm going to try to start with the straightforward uh, first. So if we need uh, time for discussion, we have a little bit of time. So, uh, and uh, as I say that, I get lost. Okay, so what are we using CSI for? Yeah, I can tackle yeah, that one. So, that. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at, at integrating Valero with the snapshot APIs that are being added to CSI. Uh, and so the, the snapshot APIs mean that uh, for anyone, any storage provider who's implementing CSI, uh, if they implement the snapshot API, then, then any consumer of CSI will be able to take advantage of that. And so we're looking at, at basically adding integration between Valero and those snapshot APIs so that um, if you're using CSI uh, to provision your volumes within your clusters, then Valero will automatically be able to take snapshots of those volumes using that API uh, as part of its backups. Yeah, I would just add to that, you know, in a CSI world, uh, it vastly increases the number of uh, storage providers that can be can underpin your Kubernetes clusters, which also means that vastly uh, expands the number of uh, storage providers that we can provide backup for. So, uh, so, uh, so CSI is very promising. We're, we're following it very closely. Great. Next question. Um, actually, Tom, would you mind uh, backing up? to the slide of the, that has the contact information. I think that would be a more useful thing to stare at. Okay, sure. Cool. All right, next question. How do we do uh, backup and restore on-prem? Yeah, so, um, so on-prem, there's, there's a number of ways to do it. First of all, uh, you know, backups are, are kept in, to, in, in uh, an object store. And so on-prem, you can run a, an S3 compatible object store, uh, or if your uh, if your storage uh, provider has an S3 compatible uh, object store, you can store your uh, your um, uh, backup data there. Uh, you can also uh, install a uh, an open source project like Minio, for instance, uh, to provide that uh, backup location and run that uh, either in your cluster or alongside a uh, cluster in your on-prem environment. Next one, how does Valero uh, uh, doing a restore, how does Valero ensure the order of the, that the Kubernetes objects get created? For example, if you, user, user accounts need to be created first, then the pods. Yeah, Steve, you wanna feel that? Yeah, I'll take that. So um, there are, you know, there are a set of, of kind of standard orders uh, that need to be respected during a restore. So for example, um, you typically want to restore a persistent volume before a persistent volume claim. Um, and so Valero is aware of those, but uh, it's also user controllable. So um, there, there is a flag to the uh, Valero server command so that if you have any sort of custom orderings that, uh, that you need to follow, that you can specify those there. Um, and then I guess one other, one other angle to that is that if you are writing a, a plugin for Valero or restore item action to customize how Valero restores a resource, um, you're able to have that plugin uh, kind of return additional related resources that should be restored. Um, and so using that, you can, you can have some additional control over how things are restored. So um, happy to, to dig into that some more uh, in detail offline, but that's, that's kind of the overview. Cool. So the next one, does Valero support OpenShift specific objects, for example, security context constraints? Yeah, so um, Valero is, is definitely capable of backing up custom resources. So to the extent that those are uh, defined as, as custom resources within your cluster, 
Uh, those will be available through the Discovery API and will be backed up and restored. Cool. Um, yeah. So I have a, there's a good product related question. Um, the question is, how can, uh, is there a plan to make Valero more complete by having features to support uh, snapshots, retention policy, and templating? And as far as templating, it would be so that you'll be known what it's being backed up and the steps that need to be performed in the container before the backup is being created. Uh, yeah, actually, um, so we, we have features for a num to solve it for a number of those. Uh, we have uh, for deciding what, what is included or excluded from a backup, uh, we do have include and exclude uh, actions that you can, that you can use. Um, we also uh, uh, support uh, snapshotting both on cloud providers today, which uh, some of the uh, uh, features that uh, that Steve showed in the first um, in the first uh, example uh, of the um, demo today. Um, also, our CSI support will be uh, is looking specifically at, at doing uh, snapshotting, for instance. So, um, so I think and Carlisi, was there another thing besides yeah. snapshotting? Retention policy. Yeah, so retention policy is really, really good. So you do have the ability within Valero to put what's called a TTL or time to live uh, on your backups. And Valero will, uh, when it backs those things up, will automatically do garbage collection and, and remove those uh, ancient backups so that it's effectively cleaning up your uh, backup targets uh, as it goes along. So if you wanted to um, save something for 30 days, that's the default TTL. If you wanted to save it for longer, seven years or, or a year or something like that, you just place that TTL on the, on the backup and, and Valera will take care of uh, managing that retention for you. All right, we have one, one more minute and I have two questions. First, uh, will later versions always support restore of, how is this assured? I missed the, the middle of that. Will they res support restore? Uh, will, la will later versions always support restore of old backups? How is that assured? Yeah, so I would say within, within a major version, so all 1.x versions will support restores of any backup created with, uh, with say, 1.0. Um, it's possible there could be breaking changes over major versions, but I think we'll always provide uh, data migration scripts if that's the case, uh, so that users uh, always have a, a path to be able to restore their older backups. Yeah, we've done that in the past. We have. Uh... Yeah, I was going to say, I think we did that with 1.0, didn't we? Yeah. All right, last question real quick. How frequently should we be backing up? Wow. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's really um, going to be dependent on on you know your own domain knowledge of your application. So uh, I would encourage everyone to take a look at um, uh, RTO and RPO, which is uh, the recovery time objective and recovery point objective. Uh, um, uh, Wikipedia. You can find out uh, on the wiki. You can find uh, that uh, those uh, things uh, and use those concepts to. Uh, make a backup plan that suits your own uh, your own uh, uh, particular use case, and then use Valero uh, schedules to to you know effectively codify that policy, and Valero will uh, will adhere to that and 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 be able to uh, manage uh, to that particular uh, your set of recovery time objectives. That's it for questions. Thank you. Okay, I want to thank everybody very much for attending today's uh, webinar. Uh, it's been uh, fantastic for us to get the, the word out. Uh, please take our, the survey. I uh, would love to hear more uh, from the community on, on how they're thinking about backup. Visit us on valero.io. And uh, for additional questions, uh, you can come uh, visit us on the Kubernetes Slack channel at, uh, uh, at Valero on, on the Kubernetes Slack. Uh, we'd love to... Uh, Love to interact with each of you. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks a lot, everyone. Goodbye. Great. Um, so thank you guys for joining us today. The webinar recording and slides will be online later today.
Um, we are looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day. Thanks, you guys.